Okay, so um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our guests connecting us from the many different time zones today. I'm Suzanne Dilar Tokash Pfeffer, the Vice President of IMOS. I'm a PhD researcher in neurolinguistics at the University of Groningen and Macquarie University, and I'm a speech and language therapist working on machine learning and AI technologies to be integrated into the digital health. And I'll be your uh, host and chair today. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for joining us at another Borderless IMOS conference. Uh, today we have six lightning talks and we will have time at the end of the talks for questions, so please send them through in the chat. During the q and I'll enable video and uh, audio for all the guests in case you would like to ask your questions verbally. And so our first speaker is Judith Schure, who is a PhD researcher at CWI, the National Research Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science in the Netherlands. And her talk, uh, talk's title is All in, All, All in Meta-Analysis, Anytime Live and Leading Interim Meta-Analysis. Judith, please share your screen. Is it full screen now? Can you see my screen full screen? Yes, but not in the presenter view. Not yet. You're not presenting yet. Is that correct now? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay. And can you see it changing also? Yes. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, I want to uh, put a spotlight on all-in meta-analysis, which is a, an approach, a statistical approach that we developed that really captures many of the things that we value in, uh, in this meta-science community. And to illustrate it, I want to take you back to the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, when we were really repurposing vaccines and treatments uh, in clinical trials. And one of the first approaches in the Netherlands was to study the BCG vaccine, uh, originally developed to protect against tuberculosis. And there was a hope that it would have a non-specific immune effect and also protect against COVID. And this trial already started very early. So this is March 2020. And the interesting thing about it was that soon after, trials around the world started asking the same question and studying this vaccine. So this is an example from, from Australia also starting early March uh, 2020. And the reason was that the Dutch BCG researchers uh, were in close contact with BCG researchers around the world. They had shared their protocol, such that all these uh, trials were uh, really quite alike because they knew that the data would come in only slowly. Um, they were observing infections, so you have to wait for them to occur and uh, to, um, to compare them occurring in the vaccine and control group. But also, if they come from trials around the world, trials asking the same question, you can worry about multiple testing issues. So if the first trial to come out with, an, uh, with a, benefit, a beneficial effect, it would publish a press release or a publication, it might force the other trials into difficult decisions. And maybe later on in a meta-analysis, this first trial would show them to be a fluke or just an outlier, and, and those trials cannot be started up again. Um, so the statistician, uh, Henry van Werkhove of this trial, he worried about this and already contacted many of those trials around the world uh, when we came to them with a solution to this problem. So, and the solution is all in meta-analysis for anytime life and leading interim meta-analysis. And what we proposed was to do this meta-analysis on an ongoing basis on interim trial data. And let this meta-analysis be the leading source of information to put the trials into context. And this is what that looked like. So we created the dashboard and the dashboard is now in, in demo mode. So this is just synthetic data. Uh, a dashboard showing all the trials on a continuous basis. So we see seven trials here in the red, orange, yellow colors. And we see the meta-analysis in blue. And what is shown here is an e-value. It's a notion of evidence that you can monitor on a continuous basis. So the larger it gets, the more evidence there is. And we can compare it to a threshold, just like a p-value. So as soon as it hits 400, we can reject a null hypothesis and for that decision have type 1 error control at an alpha level 1 over 400. So that is a 0.2.5% alpha level. And this approach 
had really many benefits. For example, its simplicity. So what is happening here is that these trials each have an e-value and that the meta-analysis is just a multiplication of the individual trial e-values. And so you can see in the shape how, how this develops over time. You can see this dip and you can see the dip in the trial where it comes from. This type 1 error control is continuous under uh, monitoring with an unlimited horizon, but also under any decision to start, stop or expand study. So we can use the evidence so far to inform whether we need to start up more trials or expand them. We can reach a conclusion early by con continuous monitoring. So we don't have to wait for these trials to be completed if the meta-analysis reaches some conclusion early. And we can even spot trends in the accumulated evidence. So this is a multiplication. So I uh, plot it on a log scale here, such that you can uh, sort of see a linear trend there and extrapolate that even. So if you're uh, going in the right direction, you can maybe guess how much time you still need, how many more events you still need before you reach a conclusion and already prepare for a future beneficial meta-analysis. So that was the statistical testing part of this. We also uh, have a, an approach to estimation that is anytime valid. So we can uh, monitor these confidence intervals over time and see how our estimations become better and better. That makes this really exciting. So a live meta-analysis is, a, way, is a, a really great way to collaborate. And it makes that all these trials were in close, close contact and advised each other on trial design. So trials that started later um, could really be designed to fit nicely into the meta-analysis to ensure homogeneity. Uh, they shared protocols such that we could arrange for an external risk of, uh, risk of bias assessment and uh, judge the risk of bias, not based on any data information, but really on the design of these trials. And they shared their data. So this was an IPD meta-analysis and, and the data cleaning was also a collaborative effort and we could really um, prevent mistakes or, or other strange things that, uh, that can happen in meta-analysis. So oh, if this is possible in a pandemic, it's great if we could focus more often on the line of research instead of the paper and reduce research waste. So thank you very much. Thank you, Judith. That was excellent. And we hope the same as well. If you have any questions for Judith, please uh, send them through in the chat. Um, our next speaker is Marton Kovacs, who is a PhD student at the lab of Palais Axel called the Meta Science Lab. And the title of his talk is Documenting Contributorship with Tensing. Martin, the screen is yours. Please share your screen. And unmute yourself, please. And also, I want to present it, right? So, okay. hello, hello everyone. Uh, as mentioned today, I want to talk about a tool that we developed called Tensing. So, research is usually conducted by teams of contributors. However, the tools that we use for collecting and managing contributors' information hardly change since the one author model. And as the number of contributors grow, managing this information is getting more and more tiresome, tiresome and error prone. And uh, I'm sure that formatting a title page like this on the slide was no one's dream growing up to be a scientist. So to mitigate these issues, we de developed Tenzing, an easy to use web app. And Tenzing facilitates managing contributors' metadata and automate their reporting. Uh, now, I want to give you a quick tour of the app and then you can follow this tour on this link or uh, via the QR code. So let me just go here. Yeah, before um, reporting, one has to collect all the necessary information from the contributors, such as their roles and their names or their email addresses, just to mention a few. and. Uh, in the past, this task was done via email by the corresponding author. But with Tanzing, we are using this standardized spreadsheet that you can see here. And this spreadsheet is created in the beginning of the project and shared with all the contributors uh, who are on the project. And they can add their own information. So there is no need to collect it um, <clears throat> from them. 
And then uh, you can indicate uh, who did what on the project using the credit taxonomy that, that you can um, see here. So before submission, I can just use this check marks. And before submission, the corresponding author can get the share URL for the uh, spreadsheet and open dancing. Sorry, I have to reload it really quick. And uh, they can just load the info sheet or the spreadsheet into Tenzing by adding this URL. And at this point, Tenzing runs some quick checks to see whether the spreadsheet is filled out cor uh, correctly. And here you can see that Tenzing warns me that there are two authors with the same initials, but this is not a problem. So after we loaded the spreadsheet, we have a couple of options, output options to choose from. The first one is creating the contributors information section where we list all uh, the participating contributors after each credit roll. And some journals require the use of initials, but this is not a problem with Tenzing. And here you can see that Tenzing automatically notices duplicated initials and writes out the full last names. Also, the second output is um, the title page of the paper, which can get really messy with a large number of authors and really hard to keep track of the um, index numbers for the affiliations. Uh, this is not a problem with Tenzing as well. And as you can see here, Tenzing supports multiple first authors and writes the name and the email address of the corresponding author as well. So for Researchers who use Armagdan and the Papaya package um, developed by Frederick Oz, the co-creator of Tenzing, to write their manuscript. Tenzing can help them out as well. Tenzing uh, creates the YAML header of, of the Armagdan file, and Papaya takes care of the rest of, rest of the work. And uh, finally, yeah, Tenzing can um, help in reporting the funding information as well. And I also want to show you this output that's not available yet. So most journal submission portals require all the information to be uploaded to their system independently. And this output option aims to overcome this tedious chore by transferring the information from the spreadsheet to an XML file. And this XML format is the same format that um, the journals use to store this information anyway. And sadly, publishing companies are not highly motivated um, today to, or currently, to change their, their um, system and enable us to transfer this information from the app to their portal. But uh, I hope in the future this option can be used to save more time for the researchers, researchers as well. And now I want to give uh, go back to my presentation. Yeah, because I feel that it's important to mention that Tenzing, the application, was named after Sherpa, who guide, um, guided and helped Edmund Hillary in their quest to reach the peaks of Mount Everest. And his contribution was not fully recognized at, at the time. And I believe that science is full of Tenzing currently, who do a lot for the success of a research project but they are usually not the one who put out the flag uh, on, the, on the peak. So our app aims to help these standings uh, to get the recognition that they deserve. And um, finally, if you have any questions regarding the web app, you can see the tutorial papers that we wrote on it or the documentation. And if you have any feature requests, just let me know. And again, I want to thank uh, all my contributors for their hard work, Alex Holcomb, Frederick Host, Julian Colomb, and Paul Ashotzil. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Great naming with great uh, reference to this phenomena, actually. Very smart. Thank you. Um, so we go on with next up we have incorporating inclusive design into open education for data science by rose frenzen and rose hartman from the children's hospital in philadelphia uh, hi everyone uh so i'm going to pull up our presentation um,
Hopefully uh, this will play with the sound correctly. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Rose Franzen and I'm excited for the opportunity to talk with you today about incorporating inclusive design into open education for data science. Uh, this is based upon our experience while developing a self-paced modular data science education program for biomedical researchers. To provide some common ground in the context of this talk, when we use the term inclusive design, what we're referring to is the process of thoughtfully building something to be as universally usable in its default state from the beginning. This is in contrast to designing the content first and then retroactively attempting to apply adaptations or fixes in order to meet various accessibility needs. The design decisions we've made so far have been a combination of static and flexible. Static rules apply across the board to all of our content, such as never using idioms or figures of speech. We've also built in flexibility wherever possible to allow folks to customize their experiences to best match their own needs and preferences. For example, we never convey information in a single modality, and we provide a variety of methods for learning, including video tutorials, articles, and interactive coding exercises. On this slide, there's a screenshot of a course that has been rendered by LeaScript, which is a markdown parser specifically designed for building courses. LeaScript has been a very important tool for us. There are a number of things about it that we love. It has integrated text-to-speech functionality. There are built-in controls that let learners change things about the content display in order to make it more readable for them. And it makes it easy to use custom CSS, which we've taken advantage of uh, to use to tweak some of the LeaScript defaults, which were inaccessible. It being a markdown parser is a huge advantage in terms of forward compatibility with accessibility tools we haven't thought to design for, or that may not have even been invented yet. Plain text files like markdown are highly portable and work well with a wide range of software. Relatedly, LeaScript is open source, which is great not only because it lets us practice what we preach in terms of modeling open behaviors, it also leaves the door open for someone else to take our materials and adapt them in ways we hadn't thought of. In addition to the usual benefits of GitHub, we've also made great use of the GitHub Issues feature and its integrated tasks functionality. We're using this to help us stick to our guidelines for all of the content we create. For each new module, we create a GitHub issue and copy paste in the Markdown checklist, which renders interactively for us to step through to make sure we're not falling short of our own standards. The screenshot on this slide shows an example of a GitHub issue with a partially filled out checklist. In the top left hand corner of the screenshot, you can see one of my favorite features, the task completion counter. At the time we took this image, seven out of 31 items on the checklist had been completed. The counter is automatically updated every time another item is checked off, providing an easy way to keep tabs on the progress of each module's quality assurance process. In determining the aforementioned guidelines, we relied on a number of really great existing resources for inclusive design, as well as the advocacy and lived experiences of a variety of accessibility advocates within STEM. We don't have time to go through all of these now, but our slides are available on GitHub and we hope you'll go check out these links later. Finally, I want to end with an important reality check. While there's definitely a lot that can be done to improve inclusive design for data science education materials, there are also some very persistent barriers embedded within the field that are difficult to address. In particular, both RStudio and Jupyter Notebooks, which are incredibly popular tools, do not fully work with screen readers or other accessibility software. In the end, our team decided to move forward with using these tools, at least for now, in part because both tools are actively being worked on to improve accessibility. Additionally, we realized that not teaching such ubiquitous tools could introduce additional barriers to learners who may want to supplement with external instruction. Additionally, though it's easy to assume that command line interfaces would be highly accessible as they are entirely text-based, Individuals who use screen readers report a variety of accessibility issues. Unfortunately, we don't have a good solution to any of these concerns yet. This is simply to bring your awareness to existing barriers within the field and to serve as a plea to keep advocating for improvements, both in the things we build and in the tools that we use. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you. Uh to both roses. <laughs> that was really nice. Um, 
And uh, okay, so we next up we have Dr. Jonathan Fuller, who is an associate professor at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science in University of Pittsburgh. And his talk in defense of using meta research evidence for evaluating therapies. All right, good. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, okay, so what I want to talk about is some conceptual work that I've done over the past few years and thinking about how the field of meta research can inform our efforts to evaluate therapeutic studies. And you've all seen findings like this one systematic reviews from meta research that analyze the existence of trends pointing towards bias in the medical literature. Here's a trend that's sometimes called industry bias, and it shows an association between industry sponsorship of a trial or other study and whether or not the results are positive, whether they show positive efficacy. And a lot of people, when they're thinking about the implications of this kind of research, including um, scientists at metrics, they think about how we can inform efforts to improve research, research practices, reporting of studies in the future, and that's all important and well. The idea is that, um, so it's not just theoretical that these problems exist, we have some empirical evidence to back it, back it up and also to point us in the right direction about where to look and what to do. But I'm interested in a related but different question, and that's, can we actually use these kinds of findings in order to correct for the biases that already exist in our current therapeutic evidence? There's no sense in which we can prevent those biases from already affecting the evidence that we've generated. So is there anything we can do about it? And a few years ago, I argued, yes, there is something we can do about it, and that we actually should be including some of these meta-research findings, those that constitute what I call meta-research evidence in therapeutic evaluation. In order to do that, I wanted to draw a distinction between two different kinds of evidence or two different senses of evidence. And this comes in part from work in philosophy that's analyzed uh, different levels of evidence. So when we talk about evidence typically in medicine or uh, even in clinical epidemiology, we often mean the results of a trial, meta-analysis or other study that directly supports some hypothesis about a treatment. Um, so a clinical trial showing that a drug is effective and safe. But there's another kind of evidence or another class of evidence we could talk about that I call meta-evidence. And that's evidence about what the bearing of that first order evidence E is on the hypothesis. So the systematic review, this Cochrane review from London all that shows the association between industry sponsorship and study results constitutes in my mind meta evidence in that it suggests there might be bias in the first order evidence that we can quantify at the level of the medical literature as a whole. And when this meta evidence comes from meta research findings, we can call it meta research evidence. So in this paper, I basically argued that um, not only is this meta evidence relevant to assessing the strength of first order evidence, but in a sense, it's indirectly relevant to the hypothesis under consideration itself. And therefore, if we want to use all the relevant evidence, we should include that, that finding. So there's a further question we can ask, and that's what practical approaches might we take in order to consider meta research findings on bias in our first order evidence evaluation? And a few scientists as well as philosophers have started thinking about this question. Here's a proposal from Miriam Solomon, a philosopher from a year ago, uh, who suggested that this finding from Lundedal could be used as a kind of correction factor. Now, findings like this one aren't really made for this purpose. They're not really meant to serve as analytic tools for correcting either our confidence and efficacy or the effect size. So I take this really just to be a proof of principle. How can we conceptualize or think about the relevance of these kinds of findings? To give you a flavor about this kind of approach, uh, basically, what Solomon was suggesting is that we take this ratio from Lundedal of positive efficacy results in industry-funded studies to positive efficacy results in non-industry-funded studies. And if we consider these rates of efficacy in the two different kinds of studies as representing the probability of finding efficacy, we can rearrange this relative risk of this ratio to give us a correction factor, which is essentially the inverse of the relative risk, which would allow us to correct for the, the influence of industry finding on net uh, on the results of a study. There's a different kind of approach that's more qualitative that we can use that a couple of different groups have already started implementing. And that's that we can actually use meta research findings as a kind of evidence base for evidence evaluation schemes or evidence hierarchies are sometimes called. Uh, so here's the very popular, widely used grade evidence ranking scheme for clinical guidelines. Essentially, what we do is we ultimately want to assign a level of confidence to the findings of a first order therapeutic study, like a trial or an observational study. And so far, the kinds of considerations that GRADE uses when they're deciding how confident we should be are things like indirectness, imprecision, publication bias. These are some worries that are justified primarily through 
um, statistical and epidemiological theory. So imprecision is basically statistical theory um, coming from frequentist statistics. It's quantified using confidence intervals. While we do have empirical research that suggests these problems like publication bias are widespread, there's an independent justification for thinking about these things that comes straight from epidemiology or statistics. Industry bias doesn't come from or isn't, isn't revealed or theorized about in clinical epidemiology or statistics. It's an empirical finding. So including it in a list like this is really more directly using meta-research as a kind of evidence base for the kinds of considerations we should include in evidence evaluation. Now, I think there are some special problems with including industry bias in particular in a, in a case like this. But again, I see this as a kind of proof of principle. And the idea is that meta-research findings can serve as an evidence base for our first order evidence evaluation. I think the details about how best to do that are interesting and yet to be worked out. So thanks so much for listening and uh, happy to chat more when we get a chance in the Q&A. Thank you so much, John, for this very interesting information. And um, our last speaker of the lightning talk session is Dr. Don Holford, who is a senior research associate at University of Bristol, a review rubric as a tool for student training and broader engagement in preprint review is your talk today. Right. Um, thank you. So um, good morning, everyone. Actually, evening here. Uh, in my five minutes today, I'm going to be addressing our effort to tackle the need for a greater and more open reviewer base for the proliferation of preprints out there. And we did this by developing and testing a review rubric tool to help guide reviewing and also teach students about the academic knowledge um, creation process. So we tested this with 60 final year um, undergraduate students who are completing the psychology module just as a pilot. So their assignment was to pick one of six preprints from SciArchive. So these were all empirical psychology papers, and they had to write a narrative review of it, a bit like when we review papers. So to facilitate this, we gave them an optional assignment to complete our rubric. Um, despite this being optional, 97% of the students actually completed the rubric in full. So our rubric consisted of 41 questions, 26 of them asking about metadata elements of the paper, such as what was the sample size, 15 of the questions were evaluations, such as assessing replicability. We also asked participants how easy it was to answer these questions. So below in that slide, you see some examples of the questions in the rubric. Uh, we also pre-registered the study, so you can have a look at that at the link at the top if you'd like. Um, and to also to help with the whole assessment, four experts also completed the rubric for the same preprints. So we have th three main questions to answer here. First, we needed to know, well, just how easy was the rubric to use? Is it usable? So here on the left, you see how students rated the rubric questions with higher scores being um, it being easier. On the right, you see how the experts rated it. Um, the bars are fairly similar across the six preprints we looked at in each case, which gives us some confidence that it isn't just that one preprint's much harder than another to use the rubric with. Um, but the black bars, so those represent metadata questions, they are consistently and significantly harder for students than the gray bars, which represent evaluated questions. And this is actually flipped for the experts, which means the main takeaway here is that students find it easier to evaluate, but experts find it easier to extract metadata. Now, our second question is, how well can students do in their evaluations? So we're going to look here at the rubric responses. We compared students to experts uh, with a caveat, of course, that we did only have four experts um, and they didn't always agree with each other either, but you're probably familiar with that in the review process. So on the left, the bars show the proportion of student answers that agreed with expert consensus. So we put the dotted black line at 50%, uh, which is the highest level of chance agreement you possibly find. Uh, so we see primarily that students are broadly quite in agreement with experts on their rubric answers, uh, but they did that deviated most from the experts when they were identifying analyses, dependent variables, and sampling, me sampling methods. On the right side, we see the same um, information for evaluative questions, and the other students resembled our small expert pool most when it came to evaluating ethical concerns, the prospect of replication, uh, and theoretical motivations of the work in the preprint. So our third question is whether, does the rubric actually assist you in writing a review? So here we analyze the reviews that students and experts wrote, just looking at instances um, where they brought up the rubric items in their reviews. So again, this graph shows a proportion of the written reviews that mentioned each of the rubric items, focusing um, just specifically on the metadata items about the preprint. So what we see here is that some items are mentioned more than others, different heights of the bars, which we take to indicate that 
these different items might be perceived more importantly uh, for writing the review. So to sum up our three questions, was the rubric usable? Yes, in general, uh, but students did find it subjectively easier to evaluate than to extract metadata from previews. Can they do it well? Well, there's considerable similarity to expert responses to some metadata questions, but it's less so for evaluative questions. So this actually gives us some potential to tap on students to do some of the groundwork of extracting metadata from preprints, perhaps as a, some kind of overlay tool we could develop. But in terms of evaluations, more training is definitely needed. We can't just throw undergraduate students into this task. Finally, is our rubric relevant? So some questions, definitely so, others less. So we definitely need a further revision to fine tune the rubric um, before launching further. So overall, we think this could be a promising tool to take forward uh, for research methods teaching, especially because students engage well with the exercise, and we could also see where they had knowledge gaps. Whether this could indeed broaden the reviewer base is a question we need to approach more carefully. Um, so far, it seems perhaps different elements of the review process could be split across individuals. Students might be good at extracting meta some metadata, uh, but we still need to improve the rubric and assess as well whether it's transferable beyond psychology because we just look primarily at sci-archive. So we very much welcome suggestions and feedback. Everyone's welcome to give us a, a try whether in your teaching or if you want to give us a few more expert samples, uh, please get in touch. The rubric's public at that link there or you can just scan the QR code to have a look. Uh, so with that, I do hope you get in touch to join us in this endeavour. Thank you and I look forward to any questions uh, at the end of this session. Okay, thank you, Dr. Down. That was really very interesting and useful also for education purposes and everything. Um, I would like to thank all of our speakers for these very interesting talks. And we have now a few minutes, like 10 minutes, um, let's say five, so we can prepare for the next uh, plenary session for questions and discussions. Um, I see a few here. So I would like to start with the first uh, comment slash uh, uh, question by Alex. Um, maybe you did want to have a, you did want to comment on it. Um, um, would you like to read it out, the question? Yeah, please. Um, so, uh, I hadn't heard of the test statistic E before, is what uh, Alex is saying. Um, mm -hmm. I remember you said it provides something like 1 over 400 error control. I'd be curious to learn more to better understand the relationship to p-values or base factors. Um, yeah, great question, of course. Um, the, uh, the relation to p-values is, is really close. So. A a p-value can also just directly compare to, to an alpha level you set in advance. Um, the, the really major difference is that an e-value is a p-value, but uh, or it is an inverse. You can say one over e is always a p, but one that is a lot more flexible than any uh, standard p-value can be because this continuous monitoring of the data and uh, comparing your e-value to the threshold whenever you like. Uh, without setting a sample size or an interim look or whatever in advance, um, that is really unique to e-values. Um, but you can use them as p-values if, you, if you're used to, used to that. Um, the relation to base factors depends on how Bayesian you are. So if you're really, really Bayesian, you actually don't care about type 1 error control. And uh, we do. So that's the starting point for e-values, that we do care about type 1 error control. But um, if you compare some base factors to a threshold, uh, they do behave like e-values, but not all of them. Okay, thank you. Um, do you want to comment on it, Alex? I will uh, now enable um, uh, video no, and audio. Uh, thanks, Judith. That's my, thank you very much. Great. We have a question from Andrew Millus for Roses. <laughs> Could you clarify which accessibility related issues in particular you're trying to address? Just visual related impairments or other things? He asks. Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, you're definitely right. This presentation did skew a little bit more toward vision, um, but we are working to reduce barriers of all kinds. Um, so in terms of disability accessibility, we're also thinking about 
uh, concerns related to cognitive profit, uh, processing difficulties, um, anxiety, neurodiversity, hearing issues, motor impairments, really anything that could um, get in the way of someone's ability to engage meaningfully with this material. Um, one example that we, we did mention is um, avoiding figures of speech and idioms, which is uh, an important for autistic learners who might not intuitively understand those. Um, and we're also considering non-disability related barriers, which the, um, the uh, idioms and figure of speech is helps with, for instance, individuals who don't speak English as their first language. Um, we're also considering other barriers like income and resources um, and uh, factors such as imposter syndrome or stereotype threat. Uh, it's a, definitely a lot to consider, um, but we think it makes more sense to try to extend these materials as widely as we can. Um, even if we might end up falling somewhat short of that lofty goal. Right. Cool, thanks. Thank you, Rose. I see another comment by Alex, but I see you replied. Do you want to add anything on that or do you like to continue that conversation? Oh, thanks, uh, Rose. Yeah, that's great to hear that uh, it supports interactive uh, quizzes. And as you say, yeah, it seems possible to um, use it in a Canvas-based uh, or Blackboard-based, et cetera, university by potentially linking out from, from Canvas to these uh, things. So um, yeah, that, that that looks great. Thank you. Yeah, and I see a few uh, comment, a few more comments by, uh, by you again. So I think that's also done. Um, any other questions? People can unmute themselves and ask if I am not missing. Vera added a rubric here and I see Andrew had a comment on it. I don't know if Vera wants to say anything about it. Well, sorry, Vera is from our team. I, I sort of replied giving the text copy as well. Oh, okay, okay. Um, she's here as well. So I see she copied something and then uh, someone, um, Andrew commented on Vera. I think it's, uh, yeah, okay. If there are any further questions, oh, Fiona. Sorry, yes, um, I don't. I don't really have any questions, but I just wanted to um, s s express my interest in John's talk and Dawn's and the overlap between that I see between those two. And um, we're, we're doing some kind of similar things on the Replicats project, and I'd love to catch up with both of you at some point and talk about that. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. We should link up um, and arrange something. I've, I've heard of Replicat, so it's really cool that we're interested in there's, there's definitely a lot of connection because we don't want to be the only ones doing this. If we can all link up across the world, that'd be wonderful. As a five time. Drop my, uh, oh. drop my email in the chat. Thank you, John. And thank you, John. Yeah, and as a five-time participants of Replicates, I can say it's a great project. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona, for all and everyone in the Replicates team for their work. Okay, if there are no other comments or questions, anything from our speaker or guests, I'll give the floor to our next chair, Fallon Moody. Thank you, everyone. And yeah, we'll continue in a few minutes. One second, Fallon. Hello. Okay, Fallon is here. Hey, host. Okay, you're the host now, Fallon. I'll mute myself now. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest. Thanks, Susan. Um, sorry, Fallon, can you make me, uh, I, I should have made you co-host, not the host. <laughs> can you make me host, co-host again? So that I can record this.
Yes, I'll stop this recording and start again.